let's uh, let's get started. I want to make a few announcements uh, beforehand uh, before I, I introduce our speaker this evening. Um, but I want to, um, and then if anyone else has other announcements, uh, let me know. <clears throat> but first of all, um, I think a week or so ago they had the premiere of um, showing of sh shifting sands. Um, and they're going to have uh, a second showing at um, the Field Museum this weekend, starting at 10 a.m. And there, there's also going to be a panel there to, um, to uh, talk about that. Um, the, I also, and I can't remember the exact date, but in June, they're going to have a premiere showing of Exit Zero. And do you know the date, Joanne? 25th. 25th, June 25th, uh, at the Hoosier Theater, and um, I don't know if you're, it's um, the same name as, as the book she wrote, uh, uh, Exit Zero. Um, and she, she grew up on the east side and um, is now, I think, a professor of chemistry at MIT. Anthropology. At, uh, anthropology, okay, at MIT, so. Um, and uh, this is kind of a story of, of the East Side and, and her childhood, and, uh, and very interesting. And, and Wisconsin Steel and the effects of uh, uh, the negative effects on, on, uh, on residents uh, when that uh, closed. Um, I also like to um, announce that um, there. We're, we're going to have um, we're Ollie and Kinda College who will co-sponsor a research summit on the Wolf Lake watershed, and that will be on uh, Friday, uh, November 4th, in Room 200. And um, we're getting we're going to review all the um, <coughs> uh, studies, scientific studies that have been done uh, dating back to the 1990s. And then we're going to talk about current studies underway, and then uh, we're going to then we're going to tie in the research with uh, planning, and um, and invite some of the um, politicians to attend as well, so they could so we can we can tie research to the plan and implementation, and that will be um, and. Much of the, this information is on our website. If you just go to our website under uh, announcements and then click on special events, and uh, you'll have the information on that. Um, and so that's, that's one thing that's going to keep me busy. Uh, this is a final uh, form for this school year, and so. We take a vacation in summer, and then um, the first speaker on September 6th will be Sue Bennett um, from the Pullman National Monument. Um, and then I think I mentioned last time uh, our Wetlands Festival is coming up on um, May 28th and 29th over Memorial Day weekend. And if we have any, um, we need some. some volunteers to help out with the canoeing, fishing, kite flying, and uh, singing. We have an ecumenical choir on um, at 7 a.m. on Sunday, May 29th. And uh, Mary directs that. And uh, so she's, uh, we're out recruiting for just folks with good voices. And that excludes me, of course. Um, any other announcements? Yes. Um, this is from um, the Convergence magazine that is put out by the South Shore Arts. Um, on uh, Sunday afternoon, June 12th, from 1 to 3 p.m., there will be an opening reception for a show called Sand and Steel, Visions of Our Indiana Shore. And that show will run through the end of August. So it sounds really nice. They say um, 
curated by Brower Museum director and curator Greg Hertzlieb. Sand and Steel will feature artwork inspired by the beauty of the Indiana dunes beginning in the early 20th century, the industry that followed, and the ecological balance struck between the two of the creation of the federally protected park in 1966. Pat, were you working on that one? No, I'm not. No. <laughs> so um, anyway, welcome and um, to this evening's presentation by Victor Cassidy. And in, um, he wrote his book in 2007 on Henry Chandler Cole. And um, um, he had, he has a copy here, right? If anybody, I have sold two copies already and before got... even raising my voice. Uh, so there's one left. Uh -huh. uh, but he's also um, written a lot on uh, the arts. His book, Sculptures at Work, was uh, published in 2011. And he's got a manuscript on artistic uh, collaborations, the magic dance. Um, and uh, a book length catalog on Stephen J. Urey, a retrospective. And um, other works with uh, exhibitions. Um, articles in national art publications include Art in America, that's 30 publications between 20, 2002 and 2009. And, um, and Art Next, 97 postings from 1997 to 2006. Um, ceramics Art and Perception, 10 publications from 2007 present and I could go on um, so he's is published in uh, many other uh, journals and magazines uh, he received his undergraduate work at Columbia College in New York and his uh, master's at the University of Wisconsin and so I just want to uh, welcome uh, Victor Cassidy Uh, I'm going to begin by saying that when something major seems to happen in science, it always seems to happen somewhere far away. Somebody digs something up in New Mexico or somebody finds something in Tibet. But what we're going to talk about today happened right around here. We could get into a car right now and in 20 minutes we'd be at the dunes. And that's what Henry Coles' life was about. So it's very nice. I mean, you all know the dunes, and you know much more about the dunes than I do. Uh, Coles was born in Connecticut. He was the son of, he was born in 1869. He grew up after the, uh, the Civil War. Uh, he was the son of a market gardener, and I think that's where he got his botany from. And from a very early age, he got interested in the plants that his father was growing. And from the time he was eight or nine years old, he would go around and make deliveries of carrots and God knows what to all of the neighbors, and that's how the, the, the family made its living. They never made a very good living, but they always ate. And he was, the whole family, was, uh, Kensington was a small town, the family was uh, congregational, which meant that the church was run by the members of the church. and. Uh, he went to church a lot. He was very serious about it, and he was involved in church activities. And the church activities were such that the kids in the church were told by the uh, preacher, you take care of this, you do this, I'm not going to interfere, I'm not going to tell you how to do it, you do it yourselves. So the kids had to take responsibility, and it was wonderful training for them, and much later on, when he was grown and so on, Coles told his daughter that he learned a lot in church. And church 
and church things were very much a part of his life. He was part of that generation. Uh, he went uh, to uh, high school, and in high school he took a very rigorous uh, training, which included Greek, Latin, history, and a lot of science. But it was a tough school. He graduated first from his class, and then he didn't have any money. So he had to wait for a year and work. I think he worked for his father and saved up money, went to Oberlin College, which was a place that would accept somebody like him because he was poor. He was Remember that very few people went to college in those days. So the people who went to college tended to be rich people. And since he was not a rich person, he was better off at Oberlin than going to one of the fancy places out east. Uh, and after graduating from Oberlin, he ran out of money again. So he got a year of teaching. He taught in Nebraska, and there was a big stink in the place where he taught because people were pulling all kinds of, of uh, stunts to uh, help somebody get a degree who didn't deserve it. And he was more than happy. In fact, he ran screaming out of the place in Nebraska and getting away from all those people. He went back to Chicago, he went back to Chicago to become a graduate student. And uh, he got his uh, degree, his, his, uh, his doctorate working in the dunes. Now I think it's time to go to the dunes and take a look at them. Here they are, and they're really a very interesting part of the world. Uh, among other things, the dunes were made uh, because the area was glaciated, and as the glaciers receded, all kinds of uh, debris, that is natural debris, uh, went into the lake, and the lakes were formed. The lakes were formed because they were gouged out by the uh, glaciers. You could imagine how huge the glaciers were, that they made these enormous lakes that are overwhelming to us. And uh, the, uh, the, the glaciers ground up a lot of ancient quartz uh, rock, which was on the floors of these uh, lakes. And over time, wave action and wind brought all of this sand south and to where the dunes are. If the prevailing winds had been in a different direction, they would have, the dunes would have been in the north or in, the, in Michigan. And of course, we do have dunes in Michigan, and we have dunes in Chicago. Only the dunes in Chicago have been taken out long ago, but we have dunes up in, in uh, Waukegan, but much smaller. The big dunes are here, and they're by no means a homogeneous uh, place. The dunes on the west side are the oldest ones, and some of them are 14,000 years old, and really quite settled dunes, and they are permanent, and they're not going to change. The dunes over here on the east are still forming. And so you have dunes of different age groups uh, in between. Here they are all shown in this map, but I don't know how easy it is to read the map. But some of the dunes of Calumet Beach Ridge, which is this thing, was formed between 11,200 and 11,800 years ago. So, in um, April 15th, 1896, Coles was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, and he went with some friends to visit this strange place called the Indiana Dunes because that was pretty much what it was. And this is what he wrote in his diary afterwards. This was my first experience in a sand dune country. We one climbed up the wonderful piles of sand and saw acres and acres <coughs> stretching up and down the lake, billowy like a prairie of drifts of snow. The sand dune flora is very characteristic and new to me. So that's the first time he saw the dunes. And that inspired him. It got him excited. And over a period of time, he decided to do his doctoral thesis about the dunes and about the, uh, what happened with the dunes, which is this, how they were formed <coughs> and the kind of plants that grew on them. 
and the order in which those plants grew. Because at the beginning, right by the beach, there's constant wave action and constant wind, so nothing grows. But at the back of the uh, beach, where there's a little bit more peace, then a few plants grow that are adapted to heat and uh, just very harsh conditions. And over time, these plants over, and this is over many generations, our lives are very short compared to the uh, kind of things that goes on uh, in, in geological time. But over a number of years, those plants will grow and die. And what do they leave? They leave behind humus. And humus allows other plants, like a sand cherry, to grow in there. In other words, the humus is what is, is the dark soil. You're looking at me and you're wondering. No? Okay. And over time, these plants are succeeded by cottonwoods and then finally by black oak. And black oak is the last plant that grows in this kind of an order. And once you have black oak, then nothing changes and no, no new plants grow until something happens, like you have a fire. And if you have a fire or you have a blowout, which is what you have here, where you had a storm, a huge storm, and it blew out a lot of the dunes and killed a lot of the plants, then succession, this is what it's called, succession begins from a, a, a middle level and it goes, eventually ends up at, at, at climax as black oak. Again, a black oak forest. And you can see all of this in the dunes. You can walk through the dunes, and as you walk through the dunes, starting at the beach and going all the way up to the top like that, you're walking through time. But you're walking through hundreds and thousands of years uh, for all of this to happen. But this is called plant succession, and this is the thing that holds how would you say? He described it in a systematic fashion. Other people before him had uh, described the plants and had described what the plants do, did and had said, okay, well, marum grass, for example, is a plant that grows on the beach. But they hadn't really put it together into a system. They hadn't made, it, made sense of it. And so Coles made sense of it, and that was his, uh, his great uh, contribution. And this was part of early ecology. Ecology started, oh, in 1866, and it was a German, Ernst Haeckel, who was a zoologist and a follower of Darwin. And he was the first person who started to write about the, uh, the relationship between environment and plants. And ecology started with plants because plants were easy to study. They don't move around. We have animal ecology, which is a much harder thing because the you know come near the animals and they skedaddle. You can't study them so easily. And you have human ecology, and they're even worse uh, than the animals. So, uh, and of course, the the descriptions that Coles made, and he did this in 1899, 1900 in his doctoral thesis and then published his doctoral thesis and that's all in my book uh, what he wrote uh, since 1900 with all those scientists there have been enormous advances in the understanding of succession and it's much more complicated than Coles made it out to be and this is what happens in science but he was the first person he was the pioneer he showed the way and other people followed and of course uh, this is the dunes formation. So, why we should care about all of this is that plant succession is a basic natural phenomenon. You see it everywhere. The land, indeed all of nature, is dynamic, constantly changing, never the same way twice. And you could test this out. You go someplace, maybe when you were in, in grade school or something, and you used to take walk to walk to school in the morning, you go to the same place, you take the same walk, and you notice the plant has changed a great deal. Uh, uh, plants have grown, plants have died, all kinds of things have happened. 
and this is the result of the changing dynamism of nature. And you know what it is, you just don't have any uh, names for it. Here he is in, the, uh, in 1898 when he was, what, 69, 31, uh, uh, 29 years old. And he was a ladies' man. Uh, he definitely enjoyed the company of the opposite sex, and he had all kinds of girlfriends. And this is the girlfriend that stuck. Uh, this is Elizabeth, who became his wife, and she was from the same kind of churchly background that he was. And she came from Kentucky, and she was one of his students. And uh, looking at her, uh, he got interested, and they were married, and married quite successfully. OK, now I want to say another thing about Coles. I get, I, can I go backwards here? Left arrow. Yeah, back Left arrow. Yeah. Sorry, Elizabeth. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to say one other thing, it, which is that Coles came along at a certain time when there were two approaches to botanical science, to natural science. One was the approach that he took, which was the intuitive approach, and the other was the approach that we take now, which is a much more ordered approach. Coles did things because he looked at things and he maybe made a list of the plants that he'd seen, but he memorized, he remembered what he'd seen and he kind of characterized the area. Uh, in 1905, uh, a book appeared uh, by Frederick Clements, and Frederick Clements uh, wrote out the modern methods that are used in doing botanical science. And it's a very simple thing that, that Clements did. He said, okay, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to take this area of uh, land where we have plants, and we're going to make a, a little square here, and we're going to make it out of pieces of wood. We call that a quadrat. And we're going to put it down. We're going to count all the plants in here. And then we're going to take it, and we're going to put it over here, and we're going to do it again, and do it again, and do it again. We're going to write all of this down, and we're going to locate these quadrats. Now you know what's in this piece of land. Now what you can, what you can do is to come back two, three, five, ten, twenty years later, and you can go back to the exact same place and make the exact same measurements, and now you have a way of comparing it, a precise way of comparing it, and you have it all written. And so when you read these accounts of, uh, you know, things are going to pieces uh, in different areas, uh, we have uh, habitat loss, we have birds being lost, we have uh, plants being endangered and so on. This is what it's based on. It's based upon this kind of measurement that people make uh, year after year and very precise measurements. Now, of course, we use uh, GPS, a Global Positioning System, and I've gone out and done measurements like this with groups, uh, counting the plants and writing it all down and then coming back the next year. So Coles did not do any of this. And so he just didn't feel comfortable with it. He'd been raised a different way. But the things that Coles wrote could not be published today because they were done in this intuitive way. So now we're going to go past Elizabeth again. And here's the botany department at the University of Chicago. And here's the boss in the middle, uh, Professor Coulter, who was a superb botanist, and again, a very churchly man. Here's Coles. Uh, and here are some of the others. There were a number of women, quite a few women, who were in botany. And uh, this is something unusual because, well, around this time, around the, the First World, this was in 19, oh, it's, in, it's already marked 1917. Now, the thing that Coles did that made him so useful was not that he wrote a lot of things. He didn't write a great deal of stuff, and he didn't publish most of his research. What he did was to inspire students, and he inspired them passionately, and they absolutely worshipped him. 
And what he did was to take them out on trips all over the country. And the women particularly liked him because you can see this is in 1907. And these are the kind of clothes that the women wore. And these are the clothes that the men wore too. The men wore uh, white shirts and vests and ties and so on, even when they were out in the field. And the women loved it because they could go and do some pretty scandalous stuff. They could sleep in tents. They could go running around in swamps. They could cook over open fires. I mean, this was just utterly shocking. <laughs> so, uh, oh yeah, yeah. And they had to wear, when they were out in the field, I think we do have, uh, well, this next picture is some of the uh, fun and games they had. Uh, this is Coles in the center with a uh, birthday cake on his head. <laughs> Uh, my minister and marrying two of his students. And here is everybody defying the law. Uh, it, for those, it says no trespassing, positively no fishing. And everybody seems to be delighted at uh, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Here are the first tree huggers. <laughs> Oh, and here is, uh, I guess, low impact. Uh, wow. And then here's just kind of silly, but it's fun. Now, in this one, you can see what the women were wearing. Uh, Coles is here, Elizabeth is here, and the ladies had to wear jodhpurs. Uh, they had to wear jodhpurs and loose stuff. And they also didn't have anything that we call sunscreen. Didn't have any of that in those days. So they had to make do, and they also didn't have any kind of uh, mosquito repellent. They had to use something called citronella, which uh, smelled heavily. And what they mostly did to protect themselves was to wear heavy clothing which must have been perfectly awful when they were in the dunes, but, you know, that's what they uh, were able to do. And, and here is Coles with his family. That's his daughter, Harriet, who was born in 1912. So I put this down, I've gated this because there's no date on it, in 1924. And it is really one of the most eccentric big photographs that I've ever seen. Uh, here's Harriet, here's Elizabeth, and they're both dressed to the nines. And then here's Henry Coles, barefoot, with his pants pulled up and so on, although he is wearing a white shirt and a tie. Hmm. <laughs> Whatever possessed them to make this picture of themselves, I don't know. But there it is. Now, Coles did more than just teach. Coles, very early on, got to be involved with Jens Jensen. And Jens Jensen was the landscape designer and conservationist. Uh, they met, I think, around 1900, became friends, and used to go out to the end of the elevated line where it was just open prairie. And so then they could go out there and botanize. Can you imagine Chicago being that way? Uh, but they, they did this, and Jensen became fully aware of uh, how important the prairie plants were, how they were being threatened, and how beautiful they were. And so he designed landscapes like this, and he got excited about conservation because, of course, people were uh, abusing the land as they had abused the dunes. And uh, so Jensen worked with Coles, and they uh, set up something called Friends of Our Native Landscape, and this was an organization, an early conservation organization. And since you're all part of Ollie, I'll tell you uh, what I was telling to Michael earlier, that Coles was the type of person who was a great number two in an organization. And number one was a guy like Jensen who had red hair and who gave passionate speeches and got the, you know, the troops all excited. But then after you've gotten the troops all excited, you have to get work done, don't you? And so you have somebody, a quiet number two, who sits in the corner, who takes notes, keeps track of everything, and gets people working together. 
so that you have an effective organization. And that's exactly what happened with, with Jensen and with Coles. Uh, Coles was definitely the lieutenant, but he was happy being the lieutenant. And Lord knows, I, I don't know how many meetings he went to uh, all over town because he was a member of multiple organizations. And even in the 1920s, no, I would say the teens, really, the teens, I don't know that he had a car. So he probably had to do all of this on public transportation and in trains and so on. It was not terribly comfortable. Uh, Friends of Our Native Landscape did a great deal of work to save the dunes and also proposed these park areas for the state of Illinois. And prior to the time of Friends of the Dunes, the only reason why the state set up parks was for historical reasons. Somebody like Lincoln which was a fine thing, but there were lots of other places that people knew of and they liked to go camping and so on, and these were some of the nicest natural areas of the state, but then there was perpetually somebody who wanted to develop it or build hot dog stands and just generally to uglify the area. And so uh, Jensen and Coles went to the state legislature and got the state legislature to begin to understand uh, how important these park, these natural areas were, and to save them. So, these are some of the places that they wanted saved. Greater Starved Rock area, the Starved Rock Park was the first park set up for natural reasons, as a natural area. And then here are some of the others. Pomona, Giant City, okay, Bald Knob, Wolf Lake area, now that's South, that's not your Wolf Lake, no, that's Fern Cliff, uh, Jackson Hollow, and so on. So we have Coles and Jensen to thank for a lot of the, the pioneering work that went into saving these state places. And you can imagine what a desert uh, we'd be if we didn't have those places. And then Coles worked with one other man, uh, not as dependably as he did with with uh, uh, Jensen, and this is Stephen Forbes. Stephen Forbes is not so well known nowadays, but he was a very important uh, conservationist and scientist in the 19th century. And one of the things that he did, <laughs> you can imagine doing this yourself, was that he would listen to the farmers and talk to the farmers and the farmers would complain, well, there were all these birds that were eating their, their crops, and uh, they wanted to get out the shotgun and kill the birds. And Forbes said, well, look, let's, let's check this out, okay? We'll get some of these birds, and we will shoot them, yes. And then we will open up their stomachs, and we'll see what they've been eating. And Forbes was an entomologist. He also, I guess, had a strong stomach, and he would take all this yuck out of the uh, the stomachs of these birds and find out what they were eating. And then he was able to come back to the farmers and say, hey, you can shoot this bird because it's really harming your crops, but don't shoot that bird because it's eating the insects that are harming your crops. And he did something like 40 different studies uh, helping the corn farmers, helping the farmers of Illinois, and he was just a prodigy. He, kept, he worked into his 80s, he had three jobs at once, and he made great, uh, did great things for Illinois science. And Coles was involved with Forbes in terms of forestry. One of the things they found out, or they discovered, not hard to miss, not hard to miss, but they found that people were coming in and by the, along the Mississippi and wherever they had uh, nice timber, they were cutting the timber, they were farming the land, and when the land got exhausted, they walked away. And so you had uh, the forest gone, you had erosion, you had just general mess. And one of the things that Coles proposed, and he did it years before anyone else thought of it, he proposed restoring these landscapes to what they had been before, which meant uh, planting trees again, and growing trees there, and protecting the land that way. 
and he didn't do it as systematically as people have done since. I mean, Aldo Leopold is kind of the follower of, of environmental, or father of environmental re, uh, restoration, and he did his work in the 30s when Coles was really pretty far gone. Uh, but this was uh, the kind of thing that they were talking about at that time, and the kind of work that they were doing, and it was, if you think conservation is an uphill battle now, uh, <laughs> oh, uh, it was much worse then, and they had to keep on fighting for it, and they were very successful and very effective. So that's the story of Henry Coles, and do you have questions or comments? You've been taking notes. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I, I, yeah. I... One thing I'd like to do, uh, Paul Trainus brought this in, and it was, it's a uh, 19, uh, 1915 a spring floor up for high schools, Coles and Coulter, who was head of the department uh, at that time. So if anyone's interested in taking a look at it, we can pass it around. I got it for my grandmother. Uh, she said they used to go on botany field trips when they were at Finger High School in Roseland, and they'd go down to the Calumet River and pick all the stuff and bring it back and put it in the jars. And uh, most of that stuff is still there. They don't call it botany department anymore, but most of the high schools kept their uh, their samples. So it's a good trend. Was he, part of the, was he part of the geography department? Was Botany part of geography? Or? No. Uh, he was part of the Botany department, and he finally founded the ecology department, started the ecology program at the University of Chicago, and he really had a plum job, because instead of having to do what a lot of professors hate doing, which is teaching the fundamentals courses, he created his own curriculum in ecology. He created the, the courses and he, with assistance, taught the courses and then he taught the seminars and then he would go on weekend trips such as to places like yeah. Calumet and all along the Illinois River and what he really did as a field teacher was that he would take some of his better students along and they would find something out in the wilderness and he'd look at it and he'd say, you know, this is an interesting question, why is this happening? And so we'd call over a student and say, look at this. You think you could answer this question? This might make a very good master's thesis or make, make a very good doctoral thesis. And then he would work with the student and guide the student as the student did the work. And then, and since Coles was very good intuitively at uh, making sense out of things yeah. and at observing things, uh, he was a great teacher to have along, and he inspired a whole generation of ecologists who went all over the country and taught all over the country, and they taught the people whose careers ended in the 70s. So the people who are teaching now are not the children of Coles, but more the, like the great-grandchildren of Coles. So they were very intrigued. When I went to the University of Chicago, I gave a lecture there. <laughs> the ecologists had completely forgotten about Colts. They had a, a portrait of him in the hallway. And uh, they were kind of abashed that they had uh, forgotten so much about what he had done uh, for ecology. Where did he live? He lived, he lived in Chicago. I pardon did you live by the university, or? We lived on South Blackstone Avenue. Oh, okay. He had one of those houses, and he, one of the things he liked to do was to have a garden. And he would, uh, he would always be trying to grow something that was not uh, normal for the area. And when he went off on a trip or something to Florida, he'd bring back a half dozen little plants from Florida to try to grow them in his garden. He had a lot of fun doing that. And his daughter, he took his daughter along with him on it, when, in the garden and taught her things too. And your interest in this sprang from? 
What? Your interest in this sprang from? From the time I was a Boy Scout, <coughs> I was interested in nature and I got all kinds of nature badges. And I was never very good at it. But then in the 90s, you know, it kind of disappeared for a number of years. And then in the 90s, I started going on Nature Conservancy walks. And we went out to these natural areas, and I really didn't know much about it. And I was intrigued with it, intrigued with the issues involved. And I spent a lot of time with it. I went to, took classes at Morton uh, Arboretum and got a naturalist certificate for taking all those classes. And, well, you know, it was very good because they're all field classes. They took you, they didn't screw around with books. They took you out of the field. And they made you look at things and they, they okay, look at, see this, and they identify this plant. And that was very nice. And you had a really broad curriculum with all these different things. We had geology, we had, uh, uh, well, we had reptiles, we had herps and stuff like that. And we had a, a herp guy who knew how to, uh, find snakes and do stuff like that. And it's a lot of fun. And then along the way, I thought, because I'm a writer, I thought, geez, well, all I do is to write books about art. I want to write a book about this other interest of mine. And I discovered that nobody had written anything about Coles, that people knew his name, but they didn't really know much about him. And so I started looking, and really fortune smiled at me because at the time that I started looking, his daughter gave all of his diaries, his personal diaries, to the University of Chicago. And he kept a diary from about the age of 10 to the time he was 25. And so I was able to use these diaries, and this was stuff that nobody knew. And then I went into the library, and I cut the well, photocopied and read all of these articles that he had written. And suddenly, you know, it made a, instead of this person just being a name, he was a human being and he had interests and he had all this other stuff. So that was a, a very exciting project because it was really totally original research. So that's what happened. <laughs> I still like nature, by the way. <laughs> Hi. Harriet became a teacher of French and Italian, and uh, she enjoyed, I suppose, plants. I met Harriet way at the end of her life when she was in pretty poor shape, and I wasn't really able to talk to her. She, well, never mind. I mean, we've all seen that with people. Uh, there were no grandchildren. Harriet didn't get married until she was around 45. <laughs> and then her mother opposed the marriage. Oh so the mother, she thought that, Her I don't know, thought that Harriet was too young or something. Wow. <laughs> so, a man of 52 or something was <laughs> seducing her. So, <laughs> yeah, at any rate, Harriet, uh, uh, Harriet did never have any children, so the grandchildren are uh, non-existent. I'm sorry I came in late. Um, the, the uh, Coles uh, Bog or Marsh that's in Indiana. Had you mentioned that earlier? Oh, that's you mean the, the Coles Bog? Oh, yeah. That was named after Coles. Yes. And did, it's a did lovely you marsh. Did you say anything about that oh. earlier? I'm oh. sorry, I didn't. Uh, I came in late. Oh, huh? Coles yeah. is all over that area. Oh. And that's I can guarantee you, you should definitely spend a lot of time at Coles the dunes. Bog. And if you do it right, you go to Tin Hook Bog, and you go at the right time of year, and you have to be allowed in, and you have to sign up for it, and all this other stuff. And then when you get in there, you see the bog, but on the way out, they have masses of wild raspberries. And you can take all you want out of there in your stomach, but you can't take any in your pocket. And so I still remember very clearly but that's enough about Pinhook Bog and Coles Bog. 
they, they have regular expeditions out there, and uh, the last one I went on was led by Noel Pavlovic, and he involved in, uh, he's the big log guru scientist, and the big dunes guru scientist, and he led the thing, and he knows everything about them, and he knows all the plants, and then they're doing a lot of restoration work out there, and he pointed out what they were doing. So if you get to know Pavlovic, and then also don't forget the berries. <laughs> what about uh, his wife and his stuff? His wife and his stuff. Yeah. Is that a good way to put it? Yeah. No. It's a sad story. Uh, he got Parkinson's disease in about 1930, 1931. He had to stop teaching in 1934 because he literally could not talk anymore and could not make a coherent sentence. So he spent the last five years of his life living at home. And of course, in this condition. And he had loads of papers in the house. He had all the makings of a book, uh, an ecology book, a major text that he never finished. And all of this stuff was thrown out after he died. And all of his professional papers were thrown out after he died. And some of them were left on him. I think when she moved out of the house, there were a lot of papers that were taken out and were left on the curb and were picked up and added to the municipal waste stream. So I didn't have enough stuff to, to write a full biography. The biography that you have in there is 90 pages long. And then the rest of it I put there because I wanted to have one place where people could go and they could get all this stuff about coals which had been scattered all over the place. So it's a tribute to Coles. This, this man who, uh, who loved the land and who did so much and so on. And there were stories in there too of other things he wanted to do. He wanted to, <laughs> they wanted to set up a, a, a study place at the dunes when the dunes were still wild. They wanted to have a big area where the ecologists could go and study the land and so on. And they could have had the land for pennies in those days because nobody was interested in the dunes except power companies or steel companies and people who wanted to take the sand. But the university wouldn't do it and there were two or three different efforts to do it. Uh, you know. Sad stories, yeah. but the, you know, yeah. conservation is full of such sad stories. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so go to the dunes. Go to the dunes. Yeah. Right now. Interesting place. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting place. Okay, okay. good. Very good. Very no good. other questions? copy of the book left if anybody wants to buy it. Get it signed by the author. To Paul. Paul is easy to spell. It's the last name that's difficult. That's why I kept it off. Hey, Michael, after uh, this weekend, the Shifting Sands film yes. going on, do you know another day that they're going to be showing that? No. Uh, I think it's just two. The one in um, at, uh, IUN and the, the, the other one. And I could find out. I'll check around. Did everybody sign in? Yes. Hey, do you want to get a...
Oh, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it on the screen. But, uh, you got any light in here? Yeah, that's right. It's right here. I can do it this way. Yeah, yeah. Great. And when are we going to get Yeah. When, when are we going to do another one? There you go. That's a good present. Good. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. We got it. It's a great cover. It is. Interesting.